It's my honor and privilege tonight to be able to um, introduce to you Grace here. Um, I am Jason Birkin and my wife Shirley sitting over there. Um, we were trained by the organization now called Ethnos New Zealand and we were sent out overseas um, from local churches here in New Zealand many years ago to share God's good news with a people group that had never heard it before. But tonight we've come here to listen to Gracia. Because of Gracia's story, she is known by millions of people around the world. And Gracia really has a powerful story to tell tonight, a very powerful story about our amazing God and how he transforms people and uses them for his good purposes. But the most important thing is that we understand that the reason that Gracia's story tonight is so powerful and important is because it's actually part of a bigger story. It's part of God's story. Why do Shirley and myself tonight get the privilege, two unknown Kiwis, why do we get the privilege of introducing Gracia to you? Well, it's all because we too are connected to the same big story, God's big story. Because of God's story, which tells us of his great plan of pursuing people among every nation, language and people group, he for some reason chose Shirley and I, us, to be his messengers to a very remote place in the Philippines and to work with him to see this accomplished. At the same time, in another part of the world, this amazing God also chose Martin and Gracia to go to the Philippines for the same purpose. Our roles in this great work were very different, but both essential to seeing the people in that isolated area reached with the good news, the news that God wanted them in his kingdom. God's timing in bringing Martin and Gracia into our lives was an essential part of his plan in reaching this particular group. It was in the earlier part of 1988 that we first met Martin and Gracia and their firstborn son, Jeffrey, on the island where we work. They had arrived to open up a flight program to assist God's messengers like us who lived in isolated areas that were hard to reach. And it was at this point of our lives that we needed Martin and Gracia and God brought them into our lives exactly the right time. My wife Shirley had just given birth to our second and our third child at the same time. <laughs> Adding to our number, three children all together. How were we going to reach this isolated group and live there? God's timing was perfect. Martin and Gracia's abilities were used by the Lord to accomplish the humanly impossible job of reaching these isolated people with his good news. So opening up a small runway on top of a mountain was Martin's job, only 274 meters long with a 152 meter drop off on each end. It was all in a day's work for Martin. Martin and Gracia gave their lives to something far bigger than themselves. They were becoming part of a story much bigger than, than themselves. And because they were there at that time, God's work amongst the Talandic people was able to continue. Martin was a friend to the first believers amongst this isolated people group, whom they helped through their ministry to also become part of this big story I'm talking about, God's story. And it's a great thing for us to know today that right now Martin is with these two friends in glory because of God's big story. When we join God in his kingdom and his kingdom work and enter into his story, his story, his story, we soon get to realize that he is the one in charge, that we are co-workers with him and we must allow him to lead us and be the ones, he, we must allow him to lead us and be the one who decides the what, the where, and the when. For many years, Martin and Gracia were able to function in the role of their aviation ministry, working alongside, the, alongside God and reaching a number of isolated people groups in the area where we were and, and the surrounding areas. But little did they realize that God had even greater things for them to be involved in. 
After they had fulfilled their role in, re in God's reaching a number of isolated people groups in the Philippines, they were then to become God's representatives to a people group that everyone else would have been too afraid to approach, a notorious kidnapping for ransom group of people. Gracious story, to me, has been added to a great list of other amazing stories that are all part of God's big story. And we can read these in the Bible, where God took these people and many others out of the comforts of their communities and thrust them into extreme change that could have so easily overwhelmed them. However, they were God's missionaries to the people they were forced to live among. For some 17 years on, each time we fly into our station, now in a different aircraft, we are reminded of our dear friends, Martin and Gracia. Our pilot has chosen to use Martin's initials as part of the call sign on the tail and on the dashboard of the helicopter as a remembrance of him. Gracia truly has an amazing story tonight to share with us. So let's hear what Gracia has to say after this video. At the end of May 2001, American missionaries to the Philippines, Martin and Gracia Burnham, made the fateful decision to celebrate their 18th wedding anniversary in a secluded resort on the island of Palawan. About four in the morning, there was pounding on the door, bang, 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 and at first I thought it was a drunk guard or something, and um, Martin kind of knew we were in trouble. And just as he got to the door, it burst open, and in came three guys with M16s, and I think one of them had a mask on. The masked men were Abu Sayyaf, a militant Muslim terrorist group with ties to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Along with 20 other guests, the Burnhams were forced from their room at gunpoint and taken many miles across the open sea to the Muslim stronghold of Basilan. For more than a year, the Burnhams were constantly on the move, living in primitive conditions in the jungle, evading capture from the Philippine military under the total control of their captors. They were the enemy, and we never forgot that they were the bad guys. But on the other hand, they were our family. They were the people that we lived with for a year, and hiked with, and starved with and you got to know the personalities of the guys. Soon after the events of September 11, the news media took greater notice of the plight of Martin and Gracia and kept their story in the national headlines. As a result, millions of people around the globe began praying diligently for their safe release. I had no idea the magnitude of how many were praying, but on towards the end, when things would be bad, I even remember that, that last day of the um, June 7, that last gun battle. We'd been hiking, sat down for a rest, and I just looked over at Martin and I said, people are praying for us. And he said, I know. Wait, we know. Throughout their captivity, the Burnhams had lived through 16 different gun battles between the Abu Sayyaf and the Philippine military. On the afternoon of June 7, over a year since their abduction, the bullets erupted once more. I dropped from the hammock, and before I even got to the ground, I was shot in the leg. And I kind of slid down the mountain. It was so steep. I slid down a little bit and came to rest beside Martin. And I looked over at him, and he was bleeding from his chest. During the gun battle, you know, the grenades were going off all around us and the shooting, but I just kept thinking every moment was my last moment. And um, sometime during that time, I just felt Martin's body just get real heavy, the heaviness. Tragically, Martin was killed during their fight. Gracia was rescued and returned home amidst a national spotlight. Was there no way Gracia or Martin could escape? Sean Hannity, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Thank you for being with us Thank you. Well, it started as a romantic getaway for Martin and Gracia Burnham, American missionaries working in the Philippines. But for her first daytime interview, I want to thank her 
for having the courage to be here today. Pleasure, good to have you with us. Thank you. The outpouring of support was beyond anything Gracia could have imagined, especially at Martin's funeral. I still didn't realize the, how many people were involved and praying and would want to go to Martin's funeral. And I looked around in the crowd and I saw some of my friends from college there, I saw some of our coworkers there. And I thought, all my friends are here. It was a good day. Martin would have been proud of his funeral. Gracia wanted to honor Martin's memory and have the opportunity to say thank you to the hundreds of thousands of people who prayed for their protection and safe return. During her time of recovery, Gracia wrote, In the presence of my enemies, a riveting personal account of her and Martin's ordeal with the terrorists. This emotionally moving, powerfully inspirational account of faith through adversity landed on the New York Times bestseller list, and millions of people came to know Gracia in a more personal way. Now a much sought after speaker, Gracia travels throughout the country speaking to audiences about the lessons and spiritual truths she learned while in captivity, and how God continues to sustain her and the children in the aftermath of Martin's death. Gracia continues to reflect on her ordeal and the lessons God taught her. To Fly Again features Gracia's most recent thoughts and reflections concerning the challenges we face when we lose control of some aspect of life and how we can find hope in God's grace. Gracia Burnham lived through a real nightmare of fear, captivity, physical trauma, and devastating loss. Yet she has survived the ordeal more convinced of God's grace than ever before. Gracia truly has lived in the presence of her enemies, and with God's help, has learned to fly again. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. Good evening. And thank you, Jason, for that kind introduction. It was our pleasure to fly for you guys, one of the highlights of our lives. Last night, as I lay down on a nice bed, I whispered, thank you, God, thank you, thank you. You know, that's exactly what I used to say when I would lay down on the jungle floor during our captivity. Thank you, God, thank you. Some of the details have changed. Last night, I lay down on a wonderful bed in this beautiful land of yours, surrounded by all the comforts of home, with kind people nearby, while in the jungle, we were surrounded by enemies, and we lay down on empty rice sacks that we begged from the Abu Sayyaf. These are rice sacks, you guys. These were our beds. Now, these rice sacks are nice and new. This one even has a cheery picture on it. The rice sacks we slept on were dirty and awful and stinky. But I was so glad to have something between us and the creepy crawlies that I thought must be on the jungle floor. Well, I knew they were because one morning I sat up to stretch and I watched a snake crawl out from under the rice sack I was on. I would kept him warm during the night, but... Although my circumstances have changed, the cry of my heart at night is the very same. Thank you, God, for taking care of me today. Thank you that I have a place to be tonight. Thank you that I've made it one more day. So I'm really happy to be here this evening. And one reason is I get to thank so many of you who prayed for us. You prayed for these nobodies that you suddenly became aware of who were in the wrong place at the wrong time, facing some pretty big hardships, and what would we have done without your prayers? It was a radio broadcast we did on a cell phone one day that allowed us to tell the outside world that my feet were really in bad shape. We were taken hostage with basically nothing, the clothes on our backs, and a few days into our captivity, they gave me a pair of old holy rubber boots that they found in an abandoned farmhouse that we passed, and I was so grateful for those. 
but I didn't have any socks. And as we would walk through rivers and streams, sand would get in my boots because they had holes in them and rub my feet raw. There were days they were bloody and oozing. One night we had walked much of the night. We heard the military was near and we just needed to move to a whole new area. We lay down in a field of long grass to get some rest and as I pulled off my boots, I could see how frightful my feet looked and I knew to even let them touch the grass was gonna hurt. So I sort of piled my boots on the grass and put my feet on top of the boots to keep them off the grass. And it seems like only minutes later they were jabbing us to get up, move. I looked at the guy with the gun. My feet, I can't go on. Well, you can't stay here, he said. So I pulled my boots back on and hobbled down the trail with everyone else. That next day they had Martin make a statement on the radio and they gave him a list of grievances that they wanted aired and he made the complaints but he was able also to let people know about my feet and you began to pray and they began to heal. I learned to wrap them in whatever I could find big leaves or old plastic bags I found along the side of the trail. Anything I could find, I would wrap my feet in before I slid them into my boots. And they started to heal. And I want to thank you for your prayers. Thank you for loving this couple that you'd never even met before. It seemed like our trial lasted forever. And that's how a trial is, isn't it? And there were days we felt like everyone had forgotten us. And there were days I felt forsaken. And I have to wonder if some of you this evening might be walking down a trail you would rather not be walking down. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place we would never have chosen to be. We didn't have a copy of the scriptures in the jungle, but I had some of God's word hidden in my heart. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. That's true for us. Whether we're dodging bullets in a gun battle or facing something just as serious here at the home front, right? Verses like this came to my mind. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When you go through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they won't sweep you over. The promises of God, aren't we glad we have those to hang on to, whatever we're facing? Right about Easter time, almost a year into our captivity, someone paid a ransom for us. And you can imagine our excitement when some of the money came into camp, because this was it. It's what we'd all been waiting for. We could all go home. And the leaders of the Abu Sayyaf sat down and had a big meeting and they called me and Martin over and we sat on the ground with them and they said, someone's paid a ransom for you, but we've decided it's not enough and we're going to ask for more. And I begged them not to do that. I said, this is not going to turn out well. We are sick of this. You're sick of this. Just take the money and let's go home. But they were greedy and they asked for more money. Well, you can imagine how defeated we felt that night when we lay down on the jungle floor to try to get some sleep. And just before I drifted off to sleep, Martin kind of nudged me and he said, Gracia, I'm so glad that when Jesus paid a ransom for us, it was enough. Martin was reminding me that Jesus' death, his payment for us, was sufficient. It satisfied God. There's nothing charged against us anymore. There doesn't need to be any more sacrifice for sin because Jesus paid it all. It's finished, done, kaput. Martin didn't actually say kaput. That's a theological term that I made up, but... What I hope for us this evening is what I share about my story will remind us again to continue on, to keep going, to keep trusting the Lord with our situations. I should mention right now that we're going to do a question-answer session when I'm done speaking, so if along the way you have questions, just jot them in your memory and we'll get to those. People ask me, what was the hardest thing about being a hostage? 
The hardest thing for me was I saw what I was really like. In one swift moment in time, everything I had except Martin was taken away from me. And when everything's gone and you're in an uncomfortable position, you see what's really in your heart. I was born into a loving Christian family. I became a believer in Jesus at an early age. I married this terrific guy who had an incredible gift of piloting airplanes, and we decided we wanted to make a difference in the world, so we packed up, and we left the American dream, and we went to the Philippines, where Martin flew food and medicine and cargo and people into some of the most primitive places in the world, and I was a pretty good person. Thought I was anyway, but in the jungle, I came face to face with a gracia I didn't want to see. I saw a me that I didn't want to believe existed. I saw a hateful gracia. There were days I hated those guys for what they were doing to us, for the pain they were causing our family. I saw a covetous gracia when we were starving, and I saw someone with food, and they ate it and didn't share it with us. I coveted what they had. I was filled with envy at them. I saw a despairing gracia. Nobody cares about us anymore. This has gone on for so long. Everyone's forgotten us. I saw a faithless gracia. Here is a journal entry that I scribbled one day on some borrowed paper using a pen that barely worked, and this is not pretty. This was a very hard day for me. Why does God keep me here to suffer day after day? I got almost hysterical in the afternoon. Martin tells me not to give up. I've tried to be a good hostage and be patient. And where has it gotten me? Eight and a half months and still here. God is pleased to have me suffer and I'm tired of it. I was reminded of those verses in Hebrews that talk about how God's word looks at our hearts and exposes us for what we really are and what I really was came out and it was shocking we may look together on the outside and we might have a whole lot of props that keep life going well for us I had lots of props a nice house my family and friends good food but God saw what I was on the inside but God's good he knows our frame he remembers that we're dust and he loves us and he's on our side when we're weak and we're needy and God didn't wait for me to get my act together there in the jungle. <clears throat> Even as I complained at him for keeping us there for so long, he started to work in my heart. I asked Martin one day, where is the love, the joy, the peace, the contentment? You know, all those things that are supposed to characterize believers in Jesus, where are those things? Because I'm looking at myself, I see the bad and the worse. Where's the good? And Martin said, love, joy, peace. Those aren't things you can just make happen in your own heart. Those are gifts from the Holy Spirit of God. Let's ask for them. Well, I had tried and failed to find those things in myself for months. So we started to pray and ask God to work good things in us. And it seems like we were either running for our lives from the Philippine military who, of, of course, were trying to rescue us, totally exhausted, or we were in what we thought was a safe place and we were hiding out and we were laying low and we were totally bored. <clears throat> and every once in a while during those days and weeks of boredom, a magazine or something to read would make its way into camp, and we loved that. Uh, we especially liked Reader's Digest because that gave us something to do. We would read those till they fell apart. Martin would read them aloud to me. I would read them aloud to him. We especially liked the jokes, and one day Martin read this joke to me. It's called Writer's Block. Having encouraged her class of 11-year-olds to use descriptive language in the story she had just asked them to write, my wife was disappointed when one boy used the adjective big to describe a castle. She asked the boy to be a bit more creative and told him to rewrite the sentence. Minutes later, he was back at her desk. This time the sentence read, I went into the castle, which was big. And when I say big, I mean big. <clears throat> 
we laughed too. A day or so later, Martin said, Gracia, I've been thinking about that joke and about something Jesus said. He said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, be the servant of all. And I think when he said all, he meant all. He didn't mean all but the bad guys holding you hostage. And I watched Martin start to serve those guys. There was this one kid, 57. That probably wasn't really his name, but that's what we called him, 57. His job was to carry the M57 through the jungle. An M57 is heavy weaponry. It's a four or five foot long metal tube type weapon. And during a gun battle, they had this three-legged tripod thing they would put it on. And they would put the mortar into the front and shoot it, in our case, at the military. Well, 57 was always in a bad mood. I told Martin, I called him 57 because for 57 days in a row, he'd been in a bad mood. One day, we were in a gun battle. We had some casualties. So did the Abu Sayyaf. Uh, so did the military. Our kidnappers killed a medic, a point man, and a radio man, which meant we gained a medical bag, a weapon, and a radio. Well, the next day when no one was looking, we went through that medical bag <clears throat> and we lifted some things that we thought we were going to need in the future, some pain reliever, some antibiotics, some anti-diarrhea medicine, and we hid that away amongst our stuff. Well, we learned that 57 suffered from headaches. That's why he was always in a sour mood. And every time we would see him start to rub his temples, Martin would take him some of our stash of pain reliever. You know that kid's attitude towards us changed totally. Not long after that, they sent 57 out on a striking force. A striking force was a group of 10 or 15 guys who they would send to another area of the island we were on to wreak some havoc in order to keep the attention away from our group. And we never knew if we would see them alive again. Things didn't always go well for them, as you can imagine. When 57 came back to camp, he was all smiles when he saw Martin. He gave him that two-cheeked greeting. As we prayed, God began giving us the victories within ourselves that we were desperately asking for. He changed us in the jungle. He gave us love for them. We began being concerned for them. He used every everyday occurrences to show us their neediness and when we saw their lostness and neediness we saw that someone needs to tell these guys the gospel they need a, a preacher oh duh maybe that's why we were in that situation to be a witness to some lost guys we were realizing that we need preachers some people willing to go to the hard places did i Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest as long as it didn't inconvenience me and mess up my comfortable life. Here's a quote that I found on Facebook of all places by a famous missionary, C.T. Studd, who could have had a comfortable life playing world-class cricket in England but instead chose hard places. He said, some people like to live within the sound of a church or a chapel bell. I want to build a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Working within a yard of hell is not going to be a pleasant place. There will be lots of opposition there. But people need to be willing to go to the hard places. And hard places is what's left in the world. Maybe a people group would be classified as hard to reach because they're isolated. There are some several thousand language groups who have no scripture in their language. They've never had anyone come into their world and tell them anything. Some don't know the basics of clean drinking water, much less what the gospel is. Working in hard places is what Ethnos New Zealand does. Ethnos New Zealand is the new name for the organization formerly known as New Tribes Mission. For 75 years, NTM, 
Ethnos New Zealand now, has been working in isolated villages, and there's still a lot to do. The job has to be done. The last tribe, the last man, and we need quality people to help us take the gospel there. And we would love to talk with anyone who's feeling called to special missionary work. Maybe a people group would be classified as hard to reach, not because they're isolated, but because of their ideology. They aren't going to be open to what you have to say, and it may not be a very safe place for you to live, but we need some people willing to go there. Maybe your job is not to go. Maybe you're to stay here and pray. I heard someone recently say, when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. We can have a worldwide ministry with any people group that we choose without ever leaving our living rooms. Pray, pray, pray. Have you heard the phrase, prayer needs no passport? Ethnos New Zealand needs prayer partners. We need those who will start praying for tribal people and our works around the world. There's a form at your seat tonight with a place for you to sign up to receive weekly prayer requests from us. You can also pick up a magazine at the back table tonight. And there's a place here to sign up to have those delivered to your home every time they come out. If you can give tonight, Please do so in order for ministry to go forward to tribal areas. There's a place for that on the form as well. Your strategic involvement is needed if we're going to reach the world with the gospel. And I bet there's something that God will prompt you to do. Could I give you an update on me? And then I have a couple more stories for you. Um, I got a call several months ago from the lead FBI investigator in charge of our case. He wanted me to know that they were closing our case. Since all the leaders of the Abu Sayyaf that held us, the Abu Sayyaf group that held us are dead, it's time to close the case. Now, all the Abu Sayyaf aren't dead. Their activities continue in the Philippines, but all the leaders involved in our case are. So case closed. So good to hear that. That's the second case that has been closed on my account. In the first case, though, I wasn't the victim of crime. I was the criminal. When I was a young child, I realized that I was a sinner. I had broken God's laws, and the penalty for that is death. But then I learned that someone paid that penalty for me. Someone died for me. I was bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ. And by faith, I accepted what Jesus did for me. And so scripture says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me which means the case folder labeled the sins of Gracia Burnham is settled as well. Case closed, forever settled. That case folder will never be opened again because he is faithful and true. Actually, if my sins were before me, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be one folder, would it? But praise be to God, all my sins were laid on Jesus and I stand forgiven a much more important case to have closed than the one I found out about a few months ago, right? The FBI is going to send an agent to bring some of Martin's effects found at that final crime scene to deliver to me in person, and I think we ought to have a Thanksgiving party at that point, <laughs> just like we have a Thanksgiving party every time we come together as believers. Thank you, God, for closing the case on our sin and our death problem. We're so grateful, and I'm grateful to have the kidnapping case closed as well. Well, you guys know how for months it looked like our release was right around the corner and then something would happen. 
and negotiations would break down again and we would be back to square one again and how that went on for what seemed like forever to us and you know how Martin died in the gun battle that rescued me but I got to come home and raise my children my kids are grown now um, they're gone from home and I have six grandchildren my children and I have been asking people like you all over the world to start praying for our captors and why are we surprised when God does something awesome and answers our prayer um, I, I don't know oh me of little faith God has given me a rest of the story several years ago an American couple that works in prison ministry in the Philippines contacted me they had gotten a hold of some comic books that our foundation printed, a comic book series, 13 comic books on the lives of the prophets, those men that Muslims believe to be prophets, Adam, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, David, on through Jesus. I have a few of them to show you here. We were so happy with these. They're beautiful, they're colorful, they're done in the Taosug language. Taosug is the language that many of the Abu Sayyaf spoke. So they gave these comics away in the prison, and the guys loved them. They said, anything else you print, we want to read. But they said, the interesting thing that's happening here is these guys found out that Gracia Burnham printed these. Some of them are coming to us saying, we're former Abu Sayyaf. We're the ones who held Martin and Gracia captive. I said, well, ask them their names. Maybe I know them. Here came the names, sure enough. Guys that we walked with, starved with, lived with, 23 or so of them in prison for the rest of their lives. There's Zacharias who on May 27 burst into our room at Dos Palmas with his M16. He was so surprised to find that our son and him had the same name, that uh, Zachary, Zacharias, that we would name one of our children after one of their Muslim prophets, and we just let him think that. Also in prison is Daoud. The guy that used to sit and talk with Martin when we would rest during our long days of hiking. Daoud's job was to carry the solar panels through the jungle. The solar panels would help charge the sat phones and the cell phones so they could talk to the outside government negotiators. Daoud's wife and child had died in childbirth. And since the economy is horrible down where he lived in the southern Philippines, he joined the Abu Sayyaf almost as a career move. Martin and Daoud would discuss all sorts of things, from jihad to being shaheed, being martyred. They discussed Daoud's hopes and dreams. They talked about whether Jesus really raised from the dead. Also in jail is Bashir. He was shot in the same gun battle that Martin died in, the one that led to my rescue. Bashir was unable to keep up with the group as they retreated down the river, so they left him behind to fend for himself in the jungle with 500 pesos, $10. You can't buy anything in the jungle. You can't take care of yourself. And several days later, the military found him. Gangrene had moved into his leg. It had to be amputated. He sends me notes every once in a while. The letters from the guys aren't the only things I've received from the guys in jail. I have this shirt that a bunch of the prison pastors signed. It says, Inmate Maximum. I said, Will and Joni, what am I supposed to do with that T-shirt? You can't wear it to the mall. This American couple and I have gotten together, we get together every other summer to figure out ways to show the love of Christ to those guys. And I could spend an hour telling you that story, but awesome things are happening. These guys are reading the scriptures in their own dialects. Some of them are going to Bible studies. I'm supporting several of the poorest of the poor. So they have some means of buying soap to take a bath 
or to wash their clothes. And we don't even know if these are good ideas or not. Maybe they're stupid ideas. But we're just asking God to bless our meager efforts. And he has. To make a long, awesome story short, so far five former Abu Sayyaf that we know of have come to know the Lord as their Savior. One of them is a very violent man with over 20 counts of murder against him. A new person in Christ, a brother in the Lord. And we really can't believe what God's doing. And we just keep praying. And I wonder if you would want to pray too. When you think of me and my story, pray for these guys, especially for Zacharias, who's very hard and resistant towards anything having to do with the gospel. God can do anything, can't he? And it's not over till it's over. And I think that God has let me be a small part of what's happening there in the prison just to encourage me because he loves doing good things for his children. Had I known while we were going through our hard year in the jungle that one day even one of those guys would come to know Jesus because of our experience, I think the days would have been easier to bear. And I could kick myself and say, would it not have been enough to trust a good God with the days of my life? I began to believe that God takes us into hard situations not to crush us, but so that we can learn to see his hand and learn to trust him when he's doing a good work. And God's work is good. It's always good. What God's doing in the midst of the mess right now is good because he's good. And I've been encouraged that there can't be a harvest without seed planters. And maybe planting seeds isn't always fun. Maybe planting seeds can be downright uncomfortable, especially when you don't see any fruit for your labors. I might wonder why I was called to plant seeds because I'm not even good at it. But all of a sudden, you see what God's doing. And I've been reminded that the seed we planted in the jungle wasn't wasted. Others are reaping what we sowed ever so long ago. So keep planting those seeds, my friend. When you feel like giving up, when you don't know what you're doing, when you don't see any fruit, keep on the seeds of the gospel that Christ died for our sins. Keep on. It's God that's going to do the work on down the road. You've been very kind this evening. Uh, you've listened well. You know, I speak a whole lot, and people are always very, very kind to me. I could stand up here and bore you to tears, and they would say, oh, that was so good, because they don't want me to feel bad, right, because I felt bad before. Uh, when I was young, I was the daughter of a pastor, and at school, kids weren't quite so kind. They knew that I was a Christian, and they said, oh, Christianity that's just a crutch. And I thought, well, let's see about crutches. On Friday night, when one of the football stars gets hurt, he comes to school on Monday on crutches. He doesn't pull himself down the hall on his hands and knees to get to class. And nobody stands and laughs at the big football player because he's on crutches. They all understand that he needs something to help him right now. We're all needy, we're ruined and broken and we need help and we all have crutches. For some, maybe it's the pride they have in their work. For some young people, maybe their good looks is their crutch. Maybe for some, it's their, their money. I heard a very wealthy man say not long ago, well, I'll just tell you who it was. It was Ted Turner. In the States, Ted Turner owns CNN, Cable News Network. It's a 24-hour news network. And statistics say that he's worth several billion dollars. And he said not long ago, Christianity is for losers. And I thought, 
your point is? That didn't offend me. We are losing. Have you taken a good look at the world lately? If you think we're doing okay, you're not watching CNN. Come to think of it, knowing Jesus, being a Christian is not a crutch. It's a stretcher. That last day in the jungle for us, we thought something had to happen. We had this feeling that something was right around the corner. We had gone for nine days without food. We were on day 10. I didn't know you could go that long without food. I thought you don't eat for three days and you drop dead. But we had salt. We had water. We were weak. We were exhausted. We were trying to get to this elusive village where our guides had been told that a ransom, a second ransom payment was waiting, but we didn't know where we were. Our guides had never been in that area before, and we were wandering around lost. And what we didn't know is the guys on the outside, the CIA, had sewn a homing device into a backpack that had been sent into Sabaya, one of the leaders of our group, a few days earlier. He thought it was from his friend out in town, and he was so proud of that backpack. So the military was able to tell what area we were in, and they were closing in on us. That evening about sundown, they decided that we should cross a road. It had been raining heavily that day, you know, just dumping rain like it, always does in the tropics and I knew that the road would be muddy and we would leave tracks when we crossed it and I told my guard go tell Sabaya we don't want to cross the road the military will see that we've been here there will be another gun battle and no one wanted that well of course they didn't listen to me and we crossed the road and sure enough the next day the soldiers saw our tracks and began following us we realized about nine in the morning that we were being followed so we started off really fast we found food that morning unripe nanka fruit uh, jackfruit we just gorged ourselves with it and kept moving and I was so discouraged and I told Martin as I always did I, I don't know how much longer I can do this and Martin said, Gracia, I've been thinking about Psalm 100 all day long, especially that first verse that talks about serving the Lord with gladness. He said, this doesn't seem much like serving the Lord. We've been walking through this jungle for over a year, but let's by faith believe that's that's what we're doing here, that we're serving the Lord, and let's do it with gladness. Wise words in that moment. Around noon, maybe it was threatening to rain, and we'd learned over our year in the jungle that there were certain unri unwritten rules between the Abu Sayyaf and the military. They never fought at night. They never fought in the rain. So we thought we were safe and stopped to wait the rain out. We set up our hammocks and the plastic sheeting to shed the water and prayed together and laid down for a rest. And suddenly the gunfire started in. The military had pressed on in the rain and they found us. And even before I hit the ground, I was wounded in the leg. And I slid down the hill. It was so very steep and wet. And I came to rest beside Barton. And I looked over at him, and he was bleeding from his chest. And I knew from experience that leg wounds might heal, but chest wounds don't. Martin lay there breathing, sort of loudly, almost like snoring. I was trying to do what he had taught me to do in gun battles, lay flat on the ground, make the smallest target you can make, and wait for someone to tell you what to do. I was trying to look dead. I thought the worst thing that can happen is the Abu Sayyaf drag me out into the jungle and I have to leave Martin and this nightmare continue. And all of a sudden, I felt Martin get very heavy. Have you heard the term, the weight of death? 
I think that's what I was feeling, but I didn't know. I'd never watched a person die before. And when the gunfire started to die down and I could hear the shouts of the Abu Sayyaf as they retreated down the river and the soldiers coming down from the top of the hill, I started to move my hands slowly around so they would know that I was alive. And they saw me moving and came and drugged me to the top of the hill and as they dragged me away from Martin I looked back at him and saw that he was white and that's when I knew he was dead and they called a helicopter and when it arrived they told me uh, we're, we're gonna move you now um, we want you to close your eyes tightly because the helicopter is kicking up a lot of debris and we don't want that to get in your eyes and I said oh no I can make it on my own I'm gonna crawl to that helicopter I don't need you is that what I said no I closed my eyes and they carried me on a stretcher and as they carried me I thought thank you God thank you for sending me help I'm going to get out of here, and I'm going to be okay. Knowing Jesus is not a crutch. It's a stretcher. For those of us who are needy and broken and can't do it on our own, and everyone is trusting something, many trust themselves, and that's up to them. But I'm thinking someday Ted Turner's going to run out of money or fame or power and he's going to find himself in need. He doesn't understand like we do that verse that says, what is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? People are trusting some pretty crazy things these days. Have you noticed that? Here's what a lady named Rhonda Burns says in the United States. She wrote a New York Times bestseller as well. She says, you are God. You are God in a physical body. You are spirit in the flesh. You are eternal life expressing itself as you. You are a cosmic being, all power, all wisdom, all intelligence, perfection, magnificence. You are the creator, and you are creating the creation of you on this planet. The earth turns on its orbit for you. The birds sing for you. The sun rises and it sets for you. The stars come out for you. Take a look around. None of it could exist without you. No matter who you thought you were, now you know the truth of who you really are. You are the master of the universe, the heir to the kingdom, the perfection of life, and now you know the secret. Hey, I knew it. There has to be some reason why I am so busy. I'm master of the universe. No wonder I'm so tired. We're all trusting something. And I choose to trust Almighty God. And I choose to believe that contrary to what Rhonda Byrne says, I am not God. I am sinful man in great need of a Savior, and I believe that God provided a Savior for me when he sent Jesus to die for me. And I believe that God is sovereign in life, and the events in the jungle didn't take him by surprise. And I believe that he's good, and that he's faithful, and that all things work together for good to those who love him. That's what I believe, and he's the one I'm trusting. And I thank you for having me tonight. God bless you guys. Thank you, Gracia. Incredible story tonight. And thank you again for just that reminder of how we do need a stretcher. We can't do it. It's not all about us, this story that we're all part of. We're a tiny wee part of something far bigger that God is doing. And just that whole idea of coming to realize that God can use us if we just let him. Thanks for that. Tonight, you have a chance to ask Gracia any questions you would like. So hopefully as she spoke, you... <coughs> 
been thinking of that. And the way we'll do this is we'll have a roving mic go around, and so when you have a question, just put up your hand and we'll direct you to that. And I'll start off with the first one to show you how we do it. Gracia, <coughs> your kids, same sort of age as ours, and how did they get on through this whole time that you and Martin were there, those 13 months? Were they disadvantaged? Did God really care for them? Mm. Well, I had the same thoughts while we were in the jungle. Um, how are the kids faring? But I learned right away that I couldn't think about the kids very much or I would like get hysterical. So every time I would think about the kids, I would think happy thoughts like, oh, it's Friday night, they're probably at a football game and they're buying popcorn and Coke and they're having a really good time. And we knew that they had been sent back to the United States to live with their grandparents in Kansas um, as soon as we were taken hostage. They weren't with us when we went down to work on that island. Uh, they had stayed behind with our co-workers. So they ended up in back in the United States and they'd never really lived there for much time before. Um, but their grandparents are people of great faith. Their, Martin's mom and dad are tribal missionaries as well. And they just happened to be home on furlough. So um, they went to a public school, but their teachers knew Jesus. It was amazing. Teacher after teacher when I got home knew the Lord and loved him. Mindy said that her computer teacher used to bring his Bible to class and he would call her up sometime during the class and say, Mindy, here are the words that God gave me for you today from the scriptures. And he always had a verse for her. And I got home and <clears throat> they were okay. They were just a year older and they, um, they're grown now. My oldest is like 31, and Mindy's 29, and Zach's 20, oh, I shouldn't have started that. I have no idea. <laughs> 26, I don't know. But um, they all love the Lord. They're very involved in missions in one way or another, uh, and God's been really, really good to us. Yeah. God knows how to do it, doesn't Amen. he? Amen. Yeah. I think a lot of you were praying for my kids. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's your chance. Please just put up your hand if you have a question and we'll get a mic to you. One over here. Thanks. Um, in the intro video, it mentioned that when you were kidnapped, there was 20-odd people mm -hmm. kidnapped. What happened to the other 18? <clears throat> um, yes, there were 20 of us taken. They just kind of swarmed the houses that were built on stilts out over the water and took all of us. And of course, the wealthy ones got out right away because they knew how to pay the ransoms. And um, so they were gone within days. Um, the more poor Filipinos... It took a while for their families to get the money together. And um, we would know that their money came in. They would say to us, so-and-so, Faye is going home today. So we would hike all day long. And then at night, we would just wait and wait. And then they would take Faye away. And we would hear a motorbike at coming at a distance on a road and... Then we would hear the motorbike go away, and Faye would never come back. So we knew that Faye's ransom had come in, and she'd gone home. And one by one, they were all ransomed out till three of us were left, me and Martin and Edebora, a, a Filipino nurse. And all three of us were shot that last gun battle. Martin and Edebora died. I was the last one to come home and tell the story. <laughs> I'm friends with a lot of them on Facebook, even today, yeah. Uh, 
uh, were you allowed to pray and sing Christian songs with them? Oh, good question. Were we allowed to pray and sing Christian songs? You know, we were. At first, we were very um, careful because we thought even if they found out we were missionaries, they would be mad at us, but it, was, it wasn't that way. They found out um, that we were with New Tribes Mission who worked with people out in the middle of nowhere, and they said, oh, those people worship sticks and stones and the rivers, and you're telling them about the one true God. You're telling them about Allah. So they didn't have problems with us. Um, Sometimes um, singing is what I did to lift my spirits. Sometimes they didn't like hearing me sing because I was a woman and women aren't, aren't given much um, credit <laughs> with them. So when I would sing, they would go, S -s -s -s, you know, to get us to stop. At one point... Um, to lift my spirits, I taught all the other hostages how great thou art. I, I wrote the words out, not just the first verse. I wrote all the verses out on a piece of old abandoned cardboard that we found along the side of the trail. And we learned it. And late at night when we thought we were in a safe place, we would start to sing. Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder, do you know that song? Let's sing it. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. One night we finished singing that song and Martin said, Gracia, you keep asking why we're still here. Maybe we're here to praise God in this very dark place. Isn't that neat? Really neat. Just in behalf of the Filipino uh, people, I'm a Filipino. We love you, Gracia. Thank you. Thank you, and I love you. I love that country so much. Nicest people on earth are in the Philippines. Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. What, what was the main language that you did speak together then? You'll have to repeat that oh. question. What was the main language that you corresponded with? Was it English or was it dialect? Mm. Um, I spoke to them in English. I didn't speak anything well. I know survival Cebuano. I, um, and we counted, and at least six different languages were being spoken amongst those guys. So they didn't even communicate real well with each other, some of them. So um, if they spoke English, we could talk to them. And Martin was so good about getting the gospel in when he would just talk to them. One day the guys were asking, um, what, what's it like when you're dating in America? Is it like you see on the movies? And Martin said, um, I'm sorry to say it is. Men don't know how to treat women well because their hearts are sinful. But when Jesus comes into your life, you get a new heart. 
Old things are passed away. All things become new, and you're a new person, and then you know how to treat women with respect, he said. <laughs> so he, he could turn any little conversation into a gospel presentation. It was pretty neat to watch. Yeah.